Welcome to our very first Cooperation Science Network live stream. The Cooperation Science Network is a group of scholars spanning many disciplines who come together to understand the fundamental principles driving cooperation and also the forces that can compromise it. We are really excited today to have with us Arvid Ogren, author of the new book, The Gene's Eye View of Evolution, which I happen to have right here with me. And he's also an evolutionary biologist at Uppsala University in Sweden. Arvid, thank you so much for being with us today. It's amazing having you on our first live stream. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be a uh, part of it. I have to say, Arvid, when I was reading your book, it was like, it took me back to undergrad and grad school when I was just like reading like all this primary literature and trying to make sense of it and trying to figure out, you know, is there really a conflict between these different perspectives? And so it was kind of almost like nostalgic for me, like remembering all of like, you know, the primary literature and that, that time in my life when I was like really passionate and, you know, I mean, I still am about these ideas, but like that's when it started for me. So it was really fun to, to read it for, for those reasons. Um, yeah, I'm really uh, happy to, to hear that. Um, the book very much was kind of born out of that uh, enthusiasm and kind of excitement about uh, about ideas and how they all fit uh, together, um, which means that it's always hard to, to answer the question that how long did it take you to write the book? Because on the one hand, the kind of time between kind of that, you know, I decided to do it or you know, sign a contract to, to, to write the book is relatively short in comparison to how long I've been thinking about these uh, ideas and how and how it, the kind of that longer period where I just uh, read these papers, the books, argued about these things with, with, with friends and colleagues um, that then eventually kind of culminated in, in a rather short writing uh, period. Yeah. When did you first get excited about these ideas? At what stage were you? I think I'd say the kind of two things. The, the most important was when I came to graduate school in Toronto, Canada. So I came there having grown up in, in Sweden and then I did undergrad in, in Scotland, in the UK. And coming to Toronto, that was kind of the first time that I really encountered students or people my age from uh, North America. And I realized rather quickly that they often had somewhat of a different approach and views on theoretical matters in, in biology. So kind of to kind of to exaggerate, exaggerate and overgeneralize a bit, it seemed like when I was a teenager or an undergraduate and had expressed interest in the, kind of the big issues in evolutionary biology, I'd been given a book by, by Richard Dawkins. Uh, and they, on the other hand, had been given one of uh, Stephen Jay Gould's. And that's kind of when I started thinking that, oh, wow, not everyone agrees on these issues. And uh, it didn't really help also kind of when I went to more senior people in the department, you would walk into one office and ask about their views on, on these matters. And they would tell you, you know, oh, you know, everyone knows that so-and-so was right. Um, and then you go to uh, the, ne the office next door and they say, oh, that's completely bonkers. You know, everyone knows that that was debunked a long time ago. And, and kind of from that grew a kind of a fascination with these, uh, these issues and what, what people disagree about them. Yeah, you know, I think that this whole issue of like, is there a conflict? Is there a controversy? You know, are um, are the scholars that study these issues, you know, talking past each other or like, you know, missing the sort of fundamental um, connection that that goes through these ideas? Like, that's something that I'd love for us to kind of play with today. Like, you know, do, do you think there is a controversy? Um, why has there been? And, um, you know, is it is it going to be moving forward? You don't have to answer yet. Um, we can keep people on the, on the hook a little bit. But I did want to show we had some great engagement on Twitter leading up to today. Um, so uh, we had a tweet um, that we, we put out maybe to be a little bit provocative saying, do you believe in selfish genes? You know, because this idea of the selfish gene has been sort of very persistent. And um, David Sloan Wilson asked, is this like believing in Santa Claus and the tooth fairy? And uh, he you know, was, was saying, well, how do you handle these complex issues like 
multi-level selection theory, um, the fact that genes participate in lots of complex networks, that there's, you know, gene environment interactions, there's developmental processes, all of this stuff. So um, I know you had a long thread responding to that, but do you want to say a few words about sort of your, your thoughts on that question? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pretty uh, typical re response, I think. It's like after all these years, it, it, you, you get the kind of rather strong reactions uh, still to, to, to the concept. Um, but also, I think the kind of the, the issues that uh, David brings up highlight why the Dean's view has kind of persisted as a debate, because they are kind of a combination of both kind of empirical issues about the extent of uh, gene interactions or to what you can study evolutionary problems without accounting for development to more kind of conceptual and almost philosophical issues about should you conceptualizing in terms of gene level selection versus multi-level selection and kind of those disagreements that are uh, both partly empirical and partly uh, conceptual, I think are kind of a, a, a trademark on many long-standing issues, particularly in, in, uh, in evolutionary biology. Um, and also I think wh why, why I was so, has been so attracted to it, but, uh, for, for those very same reasons. Yeah, th this idea of the sort of selfish gene, what's the relationship of that to the genes I view notion? So, you know, the selfish gene is this um, book by Richard Dawkins, where he kind of explains a lot of a sort of adaptationist approach where you're like, you're, you know, looking at how, how genes would evolve. But what, what's the what's the relationship between the genes I view and the selfish gene idea? So the Selfish Gene uh, was published in, in, in 1976 uh, by Richard Dawkins, as you say. And uh, it, I think it is the, uh, the way into the genes I view that most of us take, the, the writings of Richard Dawkins. Uh, and I think the Selfish Gene deserves its place in kind of the origin story of the genes I view. Uh, next to that, you have to place a book that was came out 10 years earlier by the American George Williams, Adaptation and Natural Selection, where many of the same ideas are uh, introduced, in particular, this idea that uh, biologists are often better off thinking uh, about the evolution by natural selection in terms of genes rather than organisms. And in particular, this idea that, that organisms are these kind of temporary occurrences they're too salient you know on an evolutionary time scale to really deserve the, the place of kind of the, the central uh, explanatory unit uh, and only genes that uh, can be transmitted uh, from generation to generation forming the, the lineages to, to mean that they are the kind of ultimate beneficiaries of the selective evolutionary uh, process so those ideas are all in, in Williams, 1966. Uh, but that is a book that was written for largely an academic audience. And I'd say that is a book that had a large influence on professional biologists. Um, but it's written in such a way that you kind of had to have a quite a strong background in biology to really uh, appreciate the argument. Whereas the selfish gene is, regardless of what your take on it, is you can agree that it's one of the most brilliant popular science books ever. It's written in such a way that um, you, you, you can't leave uh, unshaken by the core uh, arguments. And a, a kind of central reason for that is the, this use of this kind of co uh, colorful or much more forceful in some ways confrontational language talking about, you know, selfish genes and lumbering robots and survival machines and, 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 and so on. Uh, Do you think so kind of recasting a lot, a lot of these ideas in, in, in this kind of colorful or purple uh, language? Yeah, do you think that that was ultimately a, a really good thing for this sort of approach to have that sort of, you know, rhetor those rhetorical devices and metaphors um, and talking about genes as being selfish or has it led to some challenges as these, you know, ideas have, um, you know, gone through many different disciplines and matured in their own ways? I think both. I think it was kind of an, a key part to why it has reached such uh, influence, but also the kind of use of these kind of terms, particularly kind of use of, of selfishness, uh, I, I think gets you in, in trouble, uh, kind of especially kind of because you have all this issue how the, the, the term selfishness is used, both in kind of our common language and then in a more technical way within evolutionary biology, but even so kind of the way that genes are selfish is related to, but slightly different to the way an organism is selfish. And so on. So I think it has also kind of caused some 
troubles uh, with it uh, that you um, and I mean, if nothing else, you can say that you can express the kind of the central, the kind of argument of the Dean's side view without using the kind of the colorful terminology of the selfish gene. Um, so I think I think it's has been tremendously uh, helpful for, for for the perspective, but it's also led put it in, in some sort of uh, troubles that could have been avoided with a more neutral uh, language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a trade-off because, you know, our brains hang on to those kinds of ideas that tap into, you know, the way that we reason about the world. And selfishness is a very powerful concept. Um, but, you know, given that, you know, what happens at the level of genes doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have organisms, right, that are behaving in that way, right? And like that you can't just say, oh, genes are selfish. So that means all organisms are selfish. Um, I think that does that does create a challenge when it comes to communicating these ideas, not just with a scientific audience, but also with a broader audience. Absolutely. And even, even if that is a kind of a key message in, in, in the selfish Gene that selfish genes do, I and mean, that selfish genes do not necessarily lead to selfish people. Uh, indeed, in many ways, it can be a, a way to kind of evolve uh, things like altruism or cooperation at the organismal uh, level. Um, it's uh, has certainly led to kind of implications about selfishness at, at other levels as well. Yeah. Well, Pam is pointing out that you know at least these terms get people's attention, um, which I guess, you know, on some level, that's good, as long as we have like a chance to sort of follow up and get a little bit deeper into these issues so that you don't have misunderstandings propagated. Yeah, uh, but, but yeah, so I think, and I think that that, that is absolutely true. It's, it's, an, it's an incredible introduction to this way of, of thinking. Uh, but I think it should be read as kind of like a, as an entry point into into a larger uh, debate or in kind of into, into critical thinking about it rather than taking us kind of the, the final word on, on the issue. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Arvid, uh, what do you say we bring in our colleague Abe Gibson to chat with us a little bit about the historical context um, in some more depth? Um, so Abe Gibson is a historian of science at the University of Texas, San Antonio. Abe, awesome to have you here on the show with us. What do you what do you think so far of what we've been talking about? Thanks so much. This is a great opportunity, and uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I've been listening with interest. I read the book and enjoyed it. Um, and uh, first, I want to congratulate Dr. Orgren because the book is being promoted, or rather endorsed, by not only proponents of uh, the genes I view, the selfish gene view, but also multi-level selection. Uh, and in fact, that's one of my first questions, if that's all right, Dr. Orgren. Um, so in one of your recent exchanges with uh, biologist David Sloan Wilson, which we've already referenced earlier, uh, you remarked that the genes I view is sometimes presented as an empirical alternative to group selection, uh, but that the two can, in principle, uh, be made compatible. And so I'm hoping, can you say more about that relationship between the genes I view and multilevel selection and how they might be reconciled? Absolutely. Yeah. And so perhaps I can kind of start with what I think of kind of as the, the kind of the three legs upon which the, the genes have you stands. I'm kind of providing the, the intellectual core, if you will, of, of the concept. So the first is kind of a commitment to, to adaptationism or kind of taking uh, adaptations or the, the appearance of design in the living world as kind of the, the cardinal or central problem that a theory of evolution uh, must be able to to answer, um, and second of all, it's kind of like it grows out of the uh, the insight from population genetics that you can describe evolution as changes in uh, allele frequencies. But in particular, I would say kind of the kind of version of population genetics first advocated by uh, Ronald Fisher. And the final leg then is kind of the, the larger levels of selection debate that had occurred for a long time. But it particularly kind of grows out of a rejection of the group selection models uh, of its time. And this is kind of noticeable both in uh, George Williams' adaptation and natural selection, but also in Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene. Both of them point to what they consider the unwarranted popularity of group selection models at the time. It's kind of providing the impetus for them to, to write these books, to try to kind of write, write the record, uh, if you will. So kind of in the early days of the gene side view, I think that kind of gene level selection is presented as being kind of in some ways kind of more factually true than 
selection at other levels, particularly selection at the group uh, level. Uh, that being said, I think group selection has undergone a very interesting uh, evolution, and David Stone Wilson has been kind of part of that, and in, in a way that today people disagree about the value of it, but everyone who have thought carefully about it agree that you can you can kind of create sound models of of group group selection. Um, and how does then connect back to the genes I view then? Well, so if you will, one of the central claims of the genes I view is that evolution by natural selection requires two complementary entities, and that is uh, replicators and uh, vehicles, to use uh, Dawkins' uh, terminology. And these two entities are both necessary for, for evolution. And replicators then are whatever these kind of entities whose structure and information is passed on intact from one generation to the next. And in on, on our planet, in, in kind of organic evolution, that role is typically filled by, by genes, that they are what's being passed on from parent to offspring, forming these lineages across generations. Uh, vehicles then are whatever these replicators are kind of bundled together in, they kind of where the, the kind of these kind of transient uh, houses in which the replicators are uh, located each generation. This role then is typically filled by by the organism. So in, in a way, you can kind of think of evolution by natural selection as a process whereby vehicles survive and reproduce at different rates, and this leads to then kind of different replicator survival across uh, across evolutionary time. And kind of Arvin, the key argument. Yeah, yeah. The idea of a, the vehicle, in your book, you talk also about this notion of the interactor. And you talk about those those two concepts, like which one do you prefer and why? Are they different? Are they the same? Yeah, so the, the kind of distinction between replicator and vehicle is that Dawkins is or, uh, uh, the, the um, interactor and vehicle. The the idea of the yeah. interactor, yeah. And kind of so, so and, and and the similar kind of distinction was made by the, the late philosopher uh, David Hull, who distinguished on the one hand replicators, but then he preferred the term interactor because he thought that calling organisms vehicles made them too passive and kind of downplayed the active role that organisms play. Uh, in kind of interacting with each other and with their surrounding uh, environment. Uh, so that's why you can kind of also kind of talk about replicators and interactors. Uh, a key thing in both is that the, the replicator vehicle can be played typically by organisms, but, but can in principle also be that of a cell or of, uh, in, in, in case also of a group. Uh, and if you kind of conceptualize uh, evolution in that way, then you can kind of have selection, if you will, at a group level, which plays the role of a vehicle. The key part, however, the gene selectionists would say, is that in all cases, what really happens is that replicators are what's being passed on um, from one generation. And that's why they are the ultimate beneficiary of uh, natural uh, selection. So kind of one way of thinking about it is that if it, to think, if it take adaptation to be the central problem, and we ask, what are adaptations for at the end of the day? In all the cases, whether it's like at the cell or organism or group level, it is the replicator or the gene that is the ultimate beneficiary uh, of, uh, of natural selection. So in that way, they kind of, you can make them compatible, but in some ways, the gene selection is the gene level selection all the way down, even though different entities can play that of, of a vehicle. Yeah, Arvid, we're having a lot of um, activity in the the chat right now about how um, you know the the organism level um, and the gene level. Like, you can have organisms that are cooperative, but you know, genes that are evolving to sort of benefit themselves, and that um, you know, even George Williams um, in adaptation and natural selection, like he was already kind of thinking in a multi level selection kind of way. Um, so what are your thoughts of that? If you, you know, since, since you have gone so deep into um, this literature, um, do you think the early scholars working in this area um, sort of saw this as a, a multi-level kind of process or were they really um, focused on the genes in an atomistic kind of way? Um, so in a way, I don't think it's necessarily kind of an either or, I think, a lot of these people recognize that life is organized in a hierarchical way and we're kind of interested in how to best um, conceptualize that 
Um, I mean, in adaptation and natural selection, um, Williams do go after kind of what he thinks is this kind of lazy invocations of group level um, benefits without kind of showing the, the true, uh, showing evidence uh, for it. Um, and kind of distinguish between kind of genic selection and or, and kind of or, or, or organismic uh, adaptation, kind of in some ways kind of foreshadowing this kind of replicator vehicle or replicator interactor kind of um, kind of mechanism. Um, so I think sometimes I think I think part of the problem has been from on the side also of of ad both kind of supporters and, and critics of the genes view has sometimes confused kind of the genes view as as a process. Or as a perspective, is it a kind of like an empirical claim of kind of the level of causality in the selective process, and, and so and so kind of being process, or is it a perspective, kind of one way of, of formulating it? So kind of just to, to finish that point, is like kind of if you compare kind of the selfish gene and the extended phenotype, the extended phenotype of Dawkins' second book starts with this image of a Necker cube, the kind of 3D drawing of a cube that you can kind of see from two perspectives. And he uses that to introduce the idea that you can think of either in terms of individuals maximizing their inclusive fitness or in terms of uh, genes or replicates maximizing their survival across, it, across the, the generations. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Abe, do you want to jump in again? Sure. I actually have another question, if you don't mind, Dr. Wigren. First, thank you for that response. Uh, so because I study the history of science, I'm always interested in the social side of things. And so uh, because of Several times throughout the book and even today earlier in the live stream, you mentioned how British biologists and American biologists often disagree with one another when it comes to their most basic assumptions. I think the contrast you mentioned between people like Richard Dawkins on the one hand and Richard Bullington on the other. And so given not only your research, uh, but also your lived experience on both sides of the Atlantic, to what extent do national differences, real or imagined, uh, manifest in debates about the genes I view of evolution. So when it comes to, so the, the, the kind of the, the strand of thought that I pick up on in the book is this, this argument that uh, English or British biologists have been particularly concerned with the study of adaptations. And in the book, I kind of follow the, this argument back to the, kind of the strong standing of, of natural theology in, in Britain and the Anglican uh, church and how this kind of idea of the, the country vicar who, who studied uh, the living world and from that in the kind of the existence of the sign in the living world in, in, inferred um, evidence of, of a creator and that's kind of that kind of naturally the bled, bled into the early kind of evolutionists who could kind of replace a creator with the hand of, of natural selection um, and it's kind of best represented by the the, the writer uh, William Paley who had a huge influence on on the young Charles Darwin but it's then subsequently also been used kind of more kind of for rhetorical purposes by later generations of English biologists, including Richard Dawkins, who, who titled one of his books, The Blind Watchmaker, kind of in reference to, to, uh, to Paley. And this has kind of been contrasted then with, on the, one, on the other hand, then kind of continental uh, European uh, biologists, but also kind of Americans who have been more concerned with origins and of diversity and the kind of constraint of uh, diversity. Um, I think they probably. I think there's something to th that. Depending on where you get your training, that's going to uh, influence how you think about the world and what problems you think are important. I think also kind of in what field you get your your training. Uh, John Maynard Smith once said that he had never met a bird watcher who wasn't a adaptation adaptationist. And I think kind of if you're a field biologist, it's hard to deny the, the kind of incredible power of, of natural selection. Um, that being said, I think this is, this is somewhat anecdotal, right? And I wonder to what extent it can be as important today when we are, we are so much more connected than what kind of this the kind of generation of say Williams and, and Dawkins were to other groups. It's hard in the age of Twitter to be kind of unaware of what other people consider uh, important and kind of different uh, approaches. So uh, I think, so that, all of that to say, I think cultural background matters. I think subject matters. But also, my intuition would be that it matters less now than what it did uh, before. That's really fascinating. And it also kind of ties into you know, where we're going now with the live stream, which is thinking about 
you know, what is the future of this idea, this concept, this framework of the genes I view. So um, here to chat with us about that as well um, is Jessica Ayers. She's a psychologist and evolutionary biologist. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what this idea means and what its implications are for future directions um, for this, uh, this whole idea. So Jessica, thank you so much for, for being here with us. Do you have any um, reflection so far on what we've been chatting about? Yeah, I've loved this conversation so far. I love the book. And because I'm here to talk about the future directions, it's only fitting that the end of the book was part of my favorite because Arvid really was pulling in where we're going from here. And those are kind of the places that my questions are going to come from. Um, and specifically, like reading this book, I read The Selfish Gene at the end of my undergraduate education before I started grad school. And I really felt like I was kind of reading science fiction, but like a cool version of science fiction that's actually happening. Um, reading Arvid's book really brought that same feeling back. But I felt like instead of looking at The Wizard of Oz, I was getting to peek behind the curtain. So um, that was really fun and enjoyable for me. Um, I guess my first question, though, is really where Arvid sees some of these lines of research going, what are the big questions that we should really be looking out for? Um, are we going to still continue to talk about the multi-level versus selfish gene perspectives? Um, do we think that there's just one area where this is going to be really helpful to consider in biology? Um, just that kind of flavor. I think that the, the kind of debates about how to conceptualize um, evolution and, and, and selection will um, Continue. I think kind of the abstract nature of the, the basic principle means that you, you will able, always be able to to do so in different ways, whether it's from a gene point of view or in kind of organismic centering to the fitness or multi-level selection versions. Um, and I guess I personally think that that is quite um, okay. That in, that in biology we can have multiple ways of thinking depending on how you view the world. Different things will stand out. So I think that can only be a good thing. Uh, in the, so as you mentioned, in, in that last uh, major chapter of the book, I discussed kind of these kind of empirical implications of the genes I view, and the, most of that chapter is devoted to the study of genomic conflict or the biology, and the biology of, of selfish genetic elements, so genes that have the ability to promote their own transmission, even if it comes at a fitness cost to the organism that carries them. And that has also been my main area of, uh, of research. Um, so, and I think that that is still kind of an, a very uh, underexplored area that is kind of in the last 20, 30 years has gone from an area that was kind of considered a bit of a curiosity, uh, but not really a, a major factor in, in genome evolution to one that most people uh, recognize uh, happens in the, essentially all sexually reproducing eukaryotes. So I think that that is a super exciting area of research is still, I think, the, the most enthralling part of, of biology uh, and it's also one that has been intimately linked with, with the genes I view um, since its conception uh, essentially and the, the concepts have often gone gone hand in hand uh, even though again you can conceptualize in genomic conflict from, from many points of, of, of view uh, but that is one area that, I, that I'm used uh, I mean even in the short time that I've been part of evolutionary biology community is just uh, exploded uh, in the last uh, uh, 20 years or so. So yeah, th that is super exciting, I think. Yeah, and that segues really well into my next question, um, because what really logically flows out of this book and this perspective is that the genes don't necessarily have the same interests uh, to kind of anthropomorphize them a little bit um, that, you know, we would expect when we think of ourselves as a single organism operating in the world. And so some of the work Athena and I have been working on has actually been applying this genetic conflict theory that comes out of um, the genes I view to understanding um, specifically psychological conflict and cooperation that we see across societies. Um, and so my next question was really, what other places do you think taking this genetic conflict perspective would really be helpful as scientists are moving forward and trying to integrate some of this really theoretical and foundational biology into their own work on other populations? Yeah, I, I think kind of the, the genes I view uh, in general and in, and, and in particularly kind of when, when coupled with the uh, empirical study of genomic conflict, I think really forces us to reevaluate some of the most basic concepts in biology. Uh, and one of them is, is kind of 
the concept of, of organismality itself and what, what an organism is. Um, so one thing that I'm excited about is together with, with Manus Patton, who's a, a theorist at, at Georgetown, him and I have gotten this grant to study what has been called the, the paradox um, of the organism, which is another uh, Dawkins term. Uh, but that refers to the idea that despite all the opportunities that exist for within organism conflict, whether it's from the activity of selfish genetic elements or, or cancer cells, or other kind of uh, within organism parasites, organisms are quite often fine. They appear as these kind of cohesive uh, entities that appear to kind of trying to maximize its, uh, its fitness in one way or another. But why is that? Why is it that the, the organism does not break down from, for, from all of the, the kind of activity uh, inside? And why is it that in a lot of questions in, in evolutionary biology, you can kind of ignore the, this kind of conflict on the inside uh, and, and treat the, the organism as this kind of cohesive entity? So what we're trying to figure out is like, can you kind of capture this, this paradox in a, in a formal way to develop models that see when is it, when does it no longer make sense of thinking of an organism as one fitness maximizing entity and when does it break down into multiple competing um, agents, uh, if you will. Um, I can't help but kind of think about cancer here, right? So cancer is when the, you know, cells mutate and get dysregulated, you know, and it's not always just mutation. You can have, you know, epigenetic changes that lead cancer cells to have, you know, phenotypes that make them really work against the fitness interests of the organism. And of course, there's many layers of cancer suppression that have evolved to try to keep that under control. Um, but that's really because, you know, selection has been acting on this organism level to have those regulatory mechanisms for maintaining cellular cooperation. Yeah, and, and as I think like a fun thing to think about then is kind of like how can you kind of think, kind of take cancer genomic conflicts and kind of the organismal level and then how it all kind of fits together as like, when does it, when do all parts of the organism work together? How do you achieve the kind of the unity of purpose that is necessary to for kind of organismal level fitness to, to win out and when what are the circumstances when it breaks kind of completely uh, breaks down in kind of to um, multiple warring segments of chromosomes to to borrow Bill Hamilton's uh, phrasing. Yeah, it seems like you need both the sort of genes I view perspective and the acknowledgement that selection operates on many different levels in order to get any traction on issues like cancer, right? Because you have both processes going on that are really driven by, you know, genetic mutations that give a fitness advantage to cells. And then you have organismal level selection, um, actually, you know, on group on cooperative groups of cells, i.e. organisms, right? So when, when you start thinking about and talking about cancer, the group level is actually the organism, you know, where the mechanisms are getting selected in order to regulate sort of, you know, the emergence of selfishness within that organism. And, and I think that that's what, what, one of the things that has really transformed the larger levels of selection debate in, in the last uh, 25 years or so is the, the emergence of the so-called major transitions research program, the idea that the uh, history of life has been characterized by these transitions in, in, in individuality, whereby entities that were previously only able to survive and reproduce on their own can now only do so as part of, of larger whole. So the origins from kind of freely, free, kind of free replicates into the first genomes, multiple genomes in a cell, the origins of the origin of the eukaryotic cell, origins of multicellularity, and even kind of higher levels of uh, use of sociality. Um, and that the kind of the level of the hierarchy or the level of selection that we observe is, is are not static, but they are kind of a product of, of evolution uh, themselves, a product of, of selection. And at each in each of these kind of transitions, you need some sort of mechanism that, that promotes uh, the benefits of cooperation and suppress conflict among entities. And to me, that, that fully appreciating that really kind of has changed how I viewed. The world is really was one of those things you can't really look at an organism in the same way anymore that this kind of context that we observe with inside of organisms are kind of almost exactly what we we should expect given what the the kind of evolutionary origins of the the entities that we observe are that kind of conflicts are not just some sort of curiosity it's kind of exactly what we uh, expect to be there uh, but that then raises the question of how do you maintain this kind of uh, unity of purpose that, that is necessary for the levels to be stably uh, maintained. 
Um, and that I think also kind of sheds a lot of new light on these kind of all debates about um, about group selection and multi-level selection that you know you want to talk about on the one hand an individual multicellular organism is an individual and it's individual level selection at the same time as you say is a group selection at the level of cells and and I think that that, that has really um, moved the debate in a, in a, in a very uh, productive direction I think. Jessica, do you want to jump in with any other um, questions or comments about the, the future of these ideas? Yeah, um, listening to Arvid's responses to these questions has really kind of piqued my interest in continuing to study pregnancy and the postpartum period as a way to look at genetic conflict. Um, when you were talking about cancer a little bit earlier, it really brought to mind some of Amy Body's work looking at how specifically in women, cancer is being um, suppressed, but then when we consider conception and the fact that that in essence is an immunological process where cheating is ripe to happen because the mother's immune system has to suppress itself in order for implantation to occur, that it just, it really kind of turns that dialogue of pregnancy as this ultimate cooperative venture on its head. Um, and I know we're running a little short on time. I do have one more question though, before we open it up to everyone else. Um, just thinking about this perspective, it really kind of changes the way we look at the current pandemic. And since we can't really devoid ourselves of what's happening in the real world, how can um, the genetic conflict and the selfish gene perspective really help us understand viral evolution and how it's relating to the current pandemic? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a big um, question. Um, I, I mean, I guess the the, the, um, the, the genes I view highlights that that selection can um, act at, at a genetic level, and that everything that's part of an organism is not necessarily for, so not necessarily work for the good of that organism, um, or can don't necessarily share the uh, the same goal. Uh, the key goal, of course, then the kind of key way to unify the goals of, of the entities that are part, that kind of physically part of the same organism is if they have the same way of being transmitted. And um, viruses then are kind of the, have a very different way of, um, being, of, of being passed on compared to the rest of the genetic material in, in an organism. Uh, so I think in that way, it, it, it helps us uh, kind of conceptualize that, that interaction. Um, but kind of in, in general, when it comes to the pandemic, uh, I, I'm not sure how much uh, many wise things I have to to, to say on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it strikes me, Arvid, that you know when it comes to sort of thinking about the pandemic and you know the evolution of you know viruses and agents of infection in general, that Dawkins' idea of the extended phenotype um, and just sort of more generally these issues of how do um, genes evolve not just to change the phenotype of the organism in which they're housed, but also change the phenotypes of other entities that are out there in the world in ways that can benefit their fitness. Um, for, for me, you know, as I've been sort of working on some of these issues around, you know, how is, uh, what kind of selection pressure is, um, you know, uh, the, the virus that causes COVID under, um, it seems like, you know, this, this framework of, well, how might the virus be affecting the immune system of hosts? How mm -hmm. might it be affecting their behavior, their activity levels, their sociality? You know, th these kinds of hypotheses about what the virus might be doing really come from this sort of, you know, genes eye view, but not just that, it's this sort of extended phenotype idea that, um, you know, genes are under selection, not just for what they do to the phenotype of the entity that houses them, but also for these much broader effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's an excellent uh, point. And I think kind of one topic I want to really touch upon is that the genes have has been associated with these kind of forms of um, anthropomorphizing as a kind of heuristic that, you know, if, if I was a gene, I would do so and so, which I think also works rather well to kind of help us come up with a uh, hypothesis about uh, viruses as well. You know, if, if I was trying to you know, maximize my, my, my transmission in a population with these kind of features, what would I do? And I kind of kind of point to in productive directions um, that then can kind of be followed up with kind of more formal uh, modeling of the uh, of the process itself. Yeah. And, and if we look at, you know, 
the sort of standard view for a long time has really just been like, oh, you know, agents of infection are all bad. And of course, with, you know, the virus that causes COVID, certainly I, I think it's, it would be hard to find any upside to it. But um, there are lots of viruses that have positive effects on host fitness. And there's lots of, you know, microbes that we, you know, can't really live healthily without. And so, you know, not only do you have this sort of issue of conflict with these, you know, smaller entities that can contribute to our phenotypes, but you have this possibility, like you mentioned earlier, for this alignment of interests um, to emerge and then for selection to act on that. Yeah. And, and I think perhaps that one of the kind of take home message, I think, from, from a genes view is that, that organisms are these kind of adaptive compromises of multiple fitness interests that uh, sometimes align, but not necessarily so. And it kind of forces us to think about when they align um, and when they do not. And it, as, as, as Jessica pointed out, that it kind of turns certain things on our, on our head, for example, the interaction between a fetus um, and, and his mother that or has often been conceptualized as a purely kind of cooperative interaction. But uh, at the interview highlights that there are many reasons why it may not be. Uh, similarly, as you say, the interactions with, with our, uh, our microbiome, that uh, our, our interaction as a host with them is going to range from kind of parasitic to, to mutualistic. And so will their interactions with, with, with each other, that sometimes they, they are in kind of cooperation, some they are perhaps most of the time in, in competition uh, with each other. And that's kind of true for all. Um, genetic entities that, that are physically located in, in, in the same uh, uh, host or body. Yeah. Great. Well, I want to pull us back to uh, a big picture question here, which is, you know, these ideas of the selfish gene, the genes I view, um, you know, even notions of like, you know, what kind of entities have fitness. So Oliver Scott Curry sort of made this comment that, you know, uh, in his mind, organisms don't have fitness. So selfish genetic elements can't harm them because they don't have fitness. Um, these, you know, these kinds of issues and and questions, you know, are are they conceptual and sort of philosophical perspectives on, um, you know, on what happens in evolution, how um, organisms uh, evolve, or, you know, are they empirical, scientific concepts, um, theories that we can we can test? What's what's your view? Is it more philosophical or more of a sort of empirical scientific question? Yeah, I, th I think it's a combination of, of the two. Um, in that way, I think like the, the Dean's view does occupy this rather peculiar position in, in theoretical biology, because it's not a straightforward empirical hypothesis, I don't think, though it certainly is a very productive way of coming up with such that can then be uh, rejected or or, uh, or verified. Similarly, it's not a kind of an all-encompassing mathematical framework. They can certainly help us develop such uh, models. Um, uh, so in that way, I think it, it kind of has elements uh, of both. And kind of like the, the example of whether you conceptualize genetic conflict as always being kind of conflict that's between levels of genes. And you can kind of conceptualize, I think, cancer in this way, either as like a kind of conflict between different cells, or I think kind of between conflict of uh, different genes, same thing with genetic conflicts as either at level of genes and that of the organism, or simply between uh, uh, genes at the, kind of within the same genome or, or different genomes in, in the same uh, organism. So I think in that way, it's partly different ways of uh, how you conceptualize it. And I think both can be productive, though, you know, I, I've often preferred to, to stay at the genetic level when studying genomic conflicts mm -hmm. uh, empirically. And just to kind of do the follow up on, on Steffi's point about whether the various components of multicellular organisms are, are ever completely aligned. And probably not. I think not in sexually reproducing organisms, uh, they, they are very rarely are uh, completely aligned. I think the kind of the best bet you have for kind of complete alignment they are in uh, you, you kind of unicellular asexually reproducing uh, organisms. Um, where uh, kind of all genes share the same uh, transmission uh, route and there's kind of very little uh, room for kind of maneuvers to, to uh, intervene with that uh, pro uh, process. 
Yeah, we have another comment from our audience from Pam um, asking about this idea of anthropomorphism, right? Because thinking of um, you know, even the idea that you would look from a gene's eye view is uh, implying that there's a perspective from the gene's eye view. Um, and of course, the selfish gene um, as a phrase is definitely anthropomorphizing. What's your view on anthropomorphizing? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it a combination? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, kind of. I think my experience was the same as Pamela. One of the first things you are taught as a biologist is that we don't anthropomorphize. Uh, but on, on the other hand, one of the things you quickly realize as, as a biologist is that biologists anthropomorphize all the time. And, but I think they, they kind of vary in how comfortable they are with that, or how kind of how embarrassed they are with that fact. Actually, just recently, uh, kind of Manus Patton and I again submitted a paper where we we advocate what for what we call um, license anthropomorphizing, which is a term we, we borrowed for from uh, Alan Grafen, who used it in, in a slightly different context. But there we kind of argue that anthropomorphizing is a really kind of helpful way of, of thinking. Kind of if I was a gene, I would do so and so. Um, but you should then kind of follow this up with a um, some sort of kind of formalization, usually kind of in the, in the form of uh, mathematical uh, modeling, and that is kind of this mathematical modeling that is providing the, the license for uh, anthropomorphizing. That is kind of what makes it uh, okay to to do so. And that kind of like combination, I think, it works rather well for a lot of problems in in uh, in sort of genetic uh, conflict. So you have an intuition that you know if if I'm on the uh, in in the mitochondrial, I mean, if I'm if I'm a gene in, in the mitochondria, is strictly maternally inherited. You know, my fitness interests are different from some something that's in the in the nuclear genome that's transmitted through both uh, both sexes, for example, and that you can kind of then capture in a in a uh, formal population genetic model. And usually, then that kind of forces you to be more explicit about the assumptions you make when you actually kind of go in about how, how these kind of interactions actually uh, happen. And I think sometimes that can kind of actually help you sharpen the intu intuition or even lead to things that are kind of counterintuitive. On you kind of put in kind of the realities of, of, of uh, genetics into to your model. So kind of the two of them combined can work in a, in a in a very productive way. But yeah, I think anthropomorphism is almost impossible to avoid uh, when studying uh, biology. But we should do so in a, in a, in a in a licensed or, or kind of uh, controlled uh, way. Mm, great, um, Jessica, Abe, do either of you have any last comments or questions for Arvid? Yeah, it's been great. I've really appreciated it, it's given me a lot to think about. Thanks for this us, conversation. Abe. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to going back and rereading some of those pregnancy papers that have now been piked in my interest having talked to you. So I'm really excited about that as well. Great. Thank you, Jesse, for joining us. Well, Arvid, before we close up, I just wanted to um, pull in a uh, a tweet that um, David Sloan Wilson made earlier this morning um, for us to talk about. So um, he said that he just finished reading your book and highly recommended it, that he thought it was very scholarly and balanced. So um, that is despite, um, you know, earlier um, there being a little bit of sort of spirited back and forth about the, you know, the value of the, um, the sort of idea of, you know, the genes I view and selfish genes. So, uh, you know, I think it really says something that you've managed to write a book that appeals um, to sort of both sides of um, this debate, um, and and I'm I'm wondering what what are your thoughts sort of on the future of this? Are is it going to continue to be sort of you know the the selfish gene crowd versus the group selection and multi level selection crowd, or do you see um, a sort of coming together of these perspectives, you know, under the um, sort of broader um, idea of um, sort of adaptationism and multi level um, reasoning? Yeah, so but, but, yeah, I was happy to, to see that as, as I saw in the, in, in the tweet that, you know, I, I wouldn't have written this book if I didn't think that the, the genes have used had a net positive. A contribution to, to evolutionary theory and, and, it, and it is indeed the kind of perspective that I use most of the time in my own work. Um, that being said, kind of what I was hoping to do is kind of provide kind of guide to this debate uh, and write something that there are so many brilliant kind of polemic entries to this debate on both sides, which is why it's so fun to, to study the, the, the history of this debate. 
it is my impression that it, things have calmed down now, though, uh, and people are quite comfortable with having multiple perspectives uh, around. Um, I think it will keep flaring up every now and then. Uh, I think it is interesting to note, though, that kind of the genes I view and pretty kind of in, in, in kind of selfish genes are often used as a kind of a boogeyman when you want to present your idea as being kind of revolutionary or, or a new radical thing that like you set up selfish genes and then like you reject that and then like then you introduce that your own kind of uh, idea i think you've seen that in uh, debates over most recently the extended evolutionary uh, synthesis and kind of previous iterations of the kind of critiques of the general ideas of, of evolutionary biology that the selfish gene in particular or the genes that is used as a representative of of kind of a stale old orthodoxy um, like a straw man right that it's, it's kind of presented in a in a way that is not just simplified but kind of misrepresenting the the idea i mean i i I, I, I i yeah i i think so i think it's yeah. often kind of uh somewhat cheap shots i think there are many like interesting cr cr criticisms of the genes that you uh obviously uh, yeah. Often, uh, I think not, those are not necessarily the ones you, you hear, but you hear a kind of a simplified version uh, of them. And I think that um, that has been one of my biggest biggest frustration leading up to writing this book. That I think that on both sides of the bit, you often have a lack of nuance on the kind of case and both for and uh, against it. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what I'm hoping to, to get at here. But I think it will kind of it will continue to uh, to play a part in a lot of at least public debates uh, about it. Because I think like, you know, this other gene has had such a huge influence on uh, the, our public perception of evolutionary theory. And it's almost, it's almost unique, I think, in kind of both changing how, changing both how professional biologists and lay people thought about evolution. And I think that's, you know, whether you like it or not, you, you kind of, you can't really get around it when, when thinking about uh, evolutionary yeah. theory and its uh, recent history. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Arvid, you know, at the beginning of this stream, I was telling you about how the reading your book was kind of nostalgic for me, right? Because you're talking about all this, you know, literature that I was just steeped in, um, you know, for a decade during the time when I was just obsessed with these ideas. And, you know, for me, the conclusion that I came to after, you know, going through this primary literature is that, you know, when it comes down to it, the question is just, are the conditions for natural selection being met at whatever level we're talking about? You know, do you have heritability? Do you have um, differential fitness and do you have variation among the members of the population that's, you know, linked to those heritable things and those fitness differences? And so, you know, it, it seems like the, you know, really when it comes down to it, it's a, you know, which level of selection makes the most sense is, is kind of an empirical question based on the population structure and, you know, the extent to which these criteria for natural selection are met in the system that we're operating in. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that, that, that that is partly true. I think also these kind of like more kind of conceptual issues are part of the way to, to judge them is kind of how empirically productive are they, how good are they at generating uh, ideas that can be tested uh, empirically uh, in, in the field and in the lab, which I think at, at the end of the day is what, what truly matters, kind of like can it lead us into productive um, uh, directions. I mean, as much as I love these conceptual debates, I, I do believe that, you know, at the end of the day, evolutionary biology is about understanding living organisms and natural populations. That is kind of like, and kind of studying that is kind of the highest level of what, what we are doing. And all, all this rest, all these kind of things that are in service of, of that. And I think in that way, I think that the GW has done rather well for itself in kind of leading to, to so much kind of productive and exciting uh, work. Great. Well, Arvid, thank you so much for being with us today on our inaugural live stream. Um, for everybody, this is Arvid's book, The Genes I View of Evolution. If you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, um, highly recommend it. And I'm not alone. Um, it's uh, getting rave reviews from all sides of the perspective on um, levels of selection, etc. cetera. Um, Arvid, thank you so much for being here with us. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, for having me. It's been uh, great fun. And so thanks to you, to Abe and Jessica and everyone involved uh, with this. Great. Well, hopefully we'll um, see you again in the future. Thank you.
And thank you to all of you. This just about wraps it up for our inaugural Cooperation Science Network live stream. Um, keep your eyes out for dates and times for the rest of our spring lineup. We'll be talking to Nicola Rayani about her book, The Social Instinct, um, How Cooperation Shaped the World, um, and also with Lee Allen DeGatkin about his book, which is um, going to come out soon, called Power in the Wild. And until then, uh, we hope you all enjoy engaging with the most scientific cooperation you can find and with the very best cooperation science. So see you all next time. Thank you.